The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the opinions of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. You've probably heard the phrase that a person's eyes can be a window into the soul. But did you know your mouth can be a window to your overall health? It's true. And according to our guest today, we've got an oral health crisis going on around the globe. That's the topic for this episode of Chippa Chat. Welcome to Chippa Chat, conversations in the consumer healthcare industry with Anita Brickman. Welcome, everybody. Today, we're talking about oral health and how problems with your teeth and gums can affect the rest of your body. Brushing and flossing are not just nice to do's, folks, in your self care routine, they are critical to keeping your heart, body, and mind healthy, along with those pearly whites. Joining me to dive into this topic is Dr. Maria Ryan, Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer at Colgate Palmolive and the past president of the American Association for Dental Research. Can I call you Dr. Maria? Sure, Anita. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I know you've been speaking internationally on this topic for years and have been quoted in various media outlets as saying, we have an oral care crisis a global one on our hands. Talk to me about that. I'd love to. And and I really thank you for having me on Chippa Chats to talk about this because it is a really important issue. And and if you think about uh, it being a global health crisis, the World Health Organization has stated that 3.5 billion people in the world suffer from oral diseases. That's half of the world's population. And cavities is the most frequent one. They also suffer from periodontal disease or gum disease. And the important thing to really understand is that, you know, a healthier future starts with a healthy mouth and and oral health is essential to a person's overall health and well-being. And just as you talked about the eyes being a mirror to the soul, you can also see systemic diseases when looking in the eyes. I remember the ophthalmologist used to tell me I can pick up heart disease. Well, when you look in someone's mouth in the oral cavity, we can see changes that can suggest other oral health issues. So it truly is a window into the overall health and well-being of a person. I would imagine this problem is greater in developing nations, but what's the state of oral care here in the United States? And are some communities more prone to gum disease and cavities than others? Yeah, you know, this is another very good question. And you would think it would be much better here, but unfortunately, uh, the numbers are about the same here um, in that about 50% of our population suffers from oral diseases with the number one most common disease among children in the United States being cavities. And, you know, parents uh, who are trying to address this can lose up to three days of work taking care of children's oral health issues, and kids miss up to three days of school a year. Uh, And if you think about the general population, we have about $45 billion lost in productivity in the United States because of untreated oral diseases. Uh, We know that if you look at the overall population, 65 million Americans have untreated uh, tooth decay. They can end up affecting your overall health and well-being. And and it's unfortunate because these diseases we're talking about, cavities, periodontal disease, for the most part, they are preventable diseases. If you have really, really good oral hygiene, so tooth brushing and, and, and flossing, Uh, But yet many people either don't know they have the disease because periodontal disease is often a silent disease and many people may have it and don't know that they have it or they don't understand why it's so important to have good uh, oral hygiene. As to the second question you asked about uh, whether these diseases disproportionately uh, affect certain communities, they do. There are disparities among ethnic groups, uh, by income, by education levels. 
And uh, the CDC uh, recently found that nearly twice as many non-Hispanic Black or Mexican-American adults have untreated cavities as people who are white. Um, among working age U.S. adults, over 40 percent of low income and, and non-Hispanic Black adults have untreated tooth decay. And according to the CDC, the percentage of children ages two to five from low income households have uh, untreated cavities at three times the rate that we see at higher income households. So there are these disparities. And in addition to this, we know that patient practitioner concordance is very important to outcomes, that people like to visit doctors that look like them. And if we look at uh, my profession, we recognize that in dentistry, Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans only represent a combined 9% of all practicing dentists in the industry. And so um, our company, Colgate, is really committed to increasing diversity among the dental profession. We have a scholarship program called Audacity to Dream, which we have uh, in collaboration with the National uh, Dental Association, which represents Black American uh, dentists. Uh, we have an endowed scholarship for underrepresented minority students at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. And most recently, in 2022, uh, we started what's called Trailblazers in Oral Health Research Scholars of African American Heritage, or our TORCH program, to help increase representation in oral health research and, and in dental faculty of underrepresented uh, dentists. So I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, but we recognize what the issues are, and we're really working very hard to try and address them as a profession and for those of us in uh, consumer products, um, we recognize we have to help. Absolutely. Those are some staggering numbers. And you're right. People want to see healthcare pr practitioners that look like themselves. And so it's clearly a problem that needs to be addressed. I want to go back to cavities as the most common disease in the world. Now, I have to say, when I first heard that, I was like, wait a minute, cavities as a disease. I just thought of this as something I had to go to the dentist, get a shot that I didn't want to get and have my cavity filled. But cavities are actually disease. Yes, they are. They are a disease. And that if you don't treat that disease, you have what's called an infection, you know, and we think about an infection anywhere else as something we would have to treat. But cavities is an infection in the tooth. And the bacteria that cause it will eventually get to the nerve and the blood supply and the tooth, and that's when you get the pain. But those infections need to be treated. And if they're not treated, you eventually get inflammation that goes along with it. And that is infection and inflammation is actually what drives gum disease or periodontal disease. So it's very, very important that uh, infection and inflammation anywhere in the body be treated, particularly in the mouth. So you mentioned that inflammation, the gum disease, periodontal disease, bad stuff happening in the mouth. What does that mean for the rest of the body? We talked about how much oral health can affect other really serious conditions. What's the story? Yeah, that to me, really, really important to this discussion is that connection, Anita, in that we know that if you have infection and inflammation in your mouth, it can impact your overall health in that bacteria that are present in your mouth can actually get into the bloodstream, particularly if you have periodontal disease. So you have pockets around the teeth you have bone loss around the teeth. So it may not only lead to the tooth becoming loose and, and coming out, but it may lead to these bacteria getting into the bloodstream and they can be found in atheromatous plaques in the vessels. They can be found in amniotic fluid, you know, increasing a woman's risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes. In addition, we also know that when you have untreated gum disease, you have 
chronic inflammation. The most common chronic inflammatory disease in the world is gum disease. And that chronic inflammation in the mouth can be measured in the blood by a protein called C-reactive protein. If you have chronic inflammation, high sensitivity C-reactive protein will go up. And we know that that may be an even better indicator of your risk for heart disease, for stroke, than even your lipid levels. We're used to measuring our cholesterol levels, right? And so if you don't treat gum disease, your CRP levels are high. So between the bacteria and the inflammation, we know that untreated gum disease can increase your risk for a heart attack and a stroke by two to threefold. It can increase a woman's risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes. It can uh, increase your risk for developing diabetes. And if you have diabetes and you're trying to get your blood sugar levels down and you have gum disease, it's more difficult for you to do that. So it's really a two-way street. You know, it may increase your risk for developing diabetes. And if you have diabetes, it makes it far more difficult for you to control your diabetes. We also know that the bacteria in the mouth can increase your risk for respiratory diseases like um, COPD. It can increase your risk for pneumonia. So for people in intensive care units, they often provide oral hygiene to reduce their risk for getting pneumonia. In nursing homes, we know that we have to increase their oral hygiene to prevent their risk for pneumonia because what unfortunately most people in a, in a nursing home may die from is, is pneumonia. So these oral conditions really, really need uh, to be addressed clearly so much more far-reaching than I ever thought. And probably part of the reason your company launched Know Your OQ. Tell me about this microsite and what you're trying to do. I got together with our corporate communications uh, division and also with our marketing people. And we said, how can we get people to understand this better? And they came up with know your oral health quotient, just like people know their IQ or their EQ. And we recognize that oral health literacy throughout the world is very, very poor and that people don't prioritize their oral health uh, because they really don't understand uh, these links that you and I have been discussing. Um, They don't understand uh, what they can do to help prevent these diseases. So we felt that through Know Your OQ, which we launched this year in February, we could empower people to understand uh, their um, oral health, the importance of it, and how to improve on it. And uh, there's what a, a, a self-assessment that they can take. It only takes about two to three minutes. It's 10 questions. And you could get a zero, which means you've got to read more. And there's a lot of information on the site to help people to, to know more about these issues and how to um, prevent some of these oral diseases, or you could get a 10, right? Which is great. That means you know everything and you could share it with everyone. And, you know, our experience with the visitors to the site is that they're spending a lot of time on it. And so through Know Your OQ, we've been able to engage people. We started in the U.S., but we have programs now throughout the world where we want to really educate people about why oral health is so important, what they can do, and where they can seek help as well. All right. So let's talk about something else that's not sexy, bad breath (laughs) or halitosis. That's one of those things that, again, embarrassing, certainly a sign that there's something not so good going on. Does brushing your tongue help? And what else can people do? Yes, you know, it's it's also another topic that's not sexy. You're correct. And also, you know, when I practiced for many, many years, I was in practice for 20 years, people would come in and say, you know, I, I feel so depressed. People step away from me. They don't want to sit next to me on the train. You know, I have bad breath. Why is that? Well, sometimes it's because they have periodontal disease and I'm a periodontist. So we will look to see if someone has gum disease. So brushing, flossing, getting in between the areas that are hard to reach in between the teeth is really important to reducing the levels of bacteria. 
Um, we also know that um, if you leave bacteria in the mouth, those bacteria can produce what are called volatile sulfur compounds. And that is one of the main things that drives bad breath. So on top of cleaning your teeth, you're correct, your, your tongue uh, is an area that needs to be cleaned. And there's a lot of crevices in the tongue. And um, you can do that by brushing the tongue. You can use a tongue scraper and you can use mouthwashes. You know, mouth rinses are really, really good for getting to hard to reach areas, including the tongue, including the tonsillar crypts, because in the back of the throat, you have those tonsillar crypts and they can also accumulate bacteria. So you need to really have a clean mouth in order not to have uh, bad breath. If you do all of these things, and you still have bad breath, you should be seeing a practitioner to determine if you might have periodontal disease, which you don't know about, or if you have some other issues within the throat or in the GI system that could be impacting. But those are not as common as, you know, having bacteria on your tongue or having periodontal disease. That's usually the reason why people have bad breath. So another thing that has been debated in my family is it necessary to have a battery powered or rechargeable toothbrush? Or if you're brushing right, is your good old handy manual toothbrush enough? Is it worth investing in, in one of these, especially now that there's smart technology in toothbrushes? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, you know, a manual toothbrush is the most accessible for people. And I have to tell you, you know, when I used to, um, do a lot of work uh, at, at the University of Connecticut and in Hartford, we would have families that would have one toothbrush for the whole family. I mean, and that's not a good thing, right? Because then you're sharing bacteria. It's going all around the family. So, you know, if everyone can have a manual toothbrush and know how to use it, that is great if you do a great job. However, we do know that powered brushes do improve things. They work by either sonic technology or rotation oscillation, and that will remove more plaque generally than you can with a manual brush, um, particularly because these brushes will let you know how much time someone spends. You're supposed to spend two minutes brushing. Most people spend about 45 seconds at the most. And so by having a powered brush, it will keep you on track for the two minutes. It also will keep you on track. Some of them now you talk about smart technologies that you're supposed to brush not once a day, but twice a day. Final question. You talked a lot through this entire discussion about the disparities, what people can and can't afford access to dental care. We know some of these disparities got worse during the pandemic, especially having access to affordable dental care and maybe all the products that a person needs. What can we collectively do to fix it? Inspire our audience, Dr. Maria, about what the consumer healthcare products industry and we as people can do. Thanks, Anita. That's a very important uh, question. And, and I will tell you the pandemic, one of the things that it did show us is when it first started, they actually shut down the dental offices. They said it wasn't essential. It wasn't an essential service. I remember seeing that on the news saying, oh my God, have these people never had a toothache? I mean, who, who said that? And then when people started showing up in the emergency rooms with oral care issues, and they're usually not equipped to manage them, suddenly they realized, oh my God, we better open up the dental offices, right? So all the dental offices opened up. So we know that oral health is essential, right? We also know that people may not have access for various reasons. And the pandemic only worsened the problem. Um, it took a toll on people's oral care habits. Uh, they delayed visiting the dentist. Um, since the start of the pandemic, you know, over 60% of people have experienced an oral health issue. And um, we know that dental care was the number one uh, type of issue that was not addressed. 32% of Medicare beneficiaries 
reported that they were unable to receive dental care during the outbreak uh, of COVID-19. And, and more than a quarter of dentists uh, reported an increase in cavities and gum disease uh, among their patients during the pandemic. So we, we really brought to light the issues that we face with regards to access to care, the importance of oral care. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work that's ongoing uh, to try and improve on that. I worked at a dental school for 20 years before coming to Colgate, and we really were the safety net for millions of people um, in, you know, it was at Stony Brook University. There are 3 million people on Long Island, right outside of New York City. Most people don't realize that. And people would drive long, long distances to come to the dental schools to get care. There are federally qualified health centers that are there to help. There are dentists who do take Medicaid. Medi Medicaid. And Medicare is another issue that is, you know, people are looking into whether or not um, there'll be coverage for oral care. You may have heard that on the news uh, within Medicare for our aging population. Uh, the other thing that the pandemic made us realize is that if you have poor oral health, you are at greater risk for many of the adverse uh, outcomes that we saw in COVID patients, you know, the, the cytokine storm. Um, and we, it wasn't a surprise to many of us in, in the industry because we know that periodontal disease or gum disease is a local cytokine storm. It's somebody's excessive response to the bacteria that are accumulating around their teeth. So they end up breaking down the bone and the connective tissue. Well, it ended up that people who had periodontal disease and got COVID, they were more likely to get the cytokine storm. So when they were exposed to the virus, they were more likely to have that kind of response. We also recognize that the mouth was a portal for entry of the virus. There are a lot of the receptors for the virus in the oral cavity. COVID did a lot of bad things, uh, but it also brought to light a lot of things that we didn't understand as well and, and needed to understand, and one of them being the importance of oral health. Well, I certainly have a much greater appreciation for the importance of oral health. Thanks for joining Thank me. Thank you for joining us here at Chippa Chat. For more information and to hear our entire catalog of shows, please visit chpa.org. 